love it, love it. So, yay, it is seven o'clock. And those of you who've been to a bridge club before know that we always start promptly at starting time. People do tend to join in over the course of the, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, however long it lasts. So um, we're going to carry on in the interest of everybody else's time. So as Catherine said earlier, welcome to the Bridge Club. Welcome to day two, day two of Technicians Week on the Bridge Club. And today we're going to talk about how we work, different roles um, as veterinary technicians and things that bring people bring to the table, um, how they bring their skills to play in a variety of different ways. And Catherine's going to tell you a little bit about the Bridge Club. But before we do that, I just want to say um, thank you very much to Banfield Pet Hospital for sponsoring tonight's session. Yay. Okay. We really appreciate that. Um, Banfield has been a good emotional supporter of ours since the very beginning. So we're very happy to, that they're, they're pitching in to help us bring this conversation to you. So um, Catherine, do you want to do a quick little rundown of who we are and why we're here? So Brenda and I created this um, just, uh, gosh, holy cow, nine months ago. So, uh, and where we are- we are given birth. Yeah, we've given birth. <laughs> so, uh, and we are over a thousand members already. Um, and what you are seeing is the labor of our love. And that is the idea that we wanted to connect, engage, learn, and grow together. We wanted to find a vehicle by which we could uh, cross um, uh, geographies and time zones and find commonality. Um, and so this is TED Talks meets LinkedIn meets an old-fashioned book club. But we wanted to do it in a way that would be mindful of your time. So Brenda and I have created this to be 25 minutes. At the 25-minute mark, you're going to see me hand up this little handy-dandy zero. Then we will uh, allow people to exit as need be. And then for those who want to stay for the after party, because you'll note we do not allow PowerPoints at the Bridge Club because you don't bring the PowerPoint to a uh, party, um, <laughs> that we then carry on the conversation. So this is very much about engagement and having a great time. And uh, with that, I turn it back over to uh, Brenda to introduce our wonderful panel. Yes, so we have a panel of four fantastic technicians who are going to talk with us. Um, I'm going to introduce the four of them, and then I'm going to introduce another one of our special guests to give us our traditional Bridge Club toast to kick us off. So we are fortunate to have a um, technician who is from Livestock Practice, Ashley. Ashley Godet, raise your hand. Yay, there she is. We have a technician who works in specialty practice, Janet McConnell. Hello, Janet. Yeah, raise your hand. We have a technician who works in companion animal practice, DJ Cannon. Hello. Oh, there he is, yep. <laughs> and we have a technician who works in corporate affairs, Brianne Morrow. <laughs> We'd like to wave at all of you, so you have no idea who's who. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is give everybody a chance to talk a little bit, answer a few questions, and then we'll dig into some, um, dig into your questions, and we'll get the real conversation going. But what do want to? I want to invite Abby Hathaway from Banfield Pet Hospital. Abby, um, thank you very much for agreeing to come and be a part of our Bridge Club tonight, and for kicking us off with a toast. Excellent. Well, my name is Abby, and I'm a program manager with Banfield. I've been with them for 12 years. And what a program manager really means is that I help our associates to become uh, credentialed technicians. Um, so I'm very, I love the work that I do in learning and development as a technician. And I know uh, Banfield is just as excited to sponsor this session as you guys are to have us sponsor it. Uh, I think as technicians, we're, we join this profession because we're passionate about animals and the people that take care of them. Um, none of us had the idea that we were going to be millionaires, but we have a lot of passion for what we do. So I'm really excited to hear about all of the different uh, routes that can take and how that helps make it a, a better world for the pets that we love and the people that take care of them. Uh, so I will say, uh, I guess, cheers to uh, veterinary technicians and happy Veterinary Technician Appreciation Week. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, Whew. I'm better now. All right, it's all good. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I have three questions here that we have prepared that we'd like to pose to the panelists. So I would like to ask a question, let each panelist give a little comment or two, and then we'll see if anybody has any questions specifically to ask, and we'll move on to second and third question um, as much as we have in the next 20 minutes. And then as Catherine said, we do have the after party 
after that 20 minutes are up. So we'll be having further conversation um, among each other um, as long as we'd like after that. So, okay, question number one. So each of you in, in interviewing or talking with, with everybody who's on the panel, we've discovered everybody has a passion, a reason that they, they came to be doing what And sometimes we don't know it at the time. So I would like to ask each of you to tell us a little bit about your passion and um, keep it elevator speechish, right? We don't have all night, but um, <laughs> it's hard to put passion into 47 words or less, but let's give it a go. And tell us kind of what led you to become a veterinary technician and what led you to where you are right now. So who wants to go first? All right, Janet, you're in the top row, go. <laughs> I feel like I'm in Hollywood Squares. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. I'm honored to be part of this discussion. Um, I, since I was a little girl, always wanted to be a veterinary technician. I didn't want to go to vet school. I, you know, was not into it for like the long haul and veterinary technician was the way to go. In 1981, I graduated and had to convince everybody that there was such a thing as a technician um, and have never looked back. I've worked in general, I've worked in specialty, I worked in supervision, uh, management, and then my true passion is really, I discovered probably in the last seven years, and that's in uh, empowering and development and education. And that's primarily through the many students that came through our doors at Red Bank Veterinary Hospital. And now I get to take that to Compassion First and work with over 40 hospitals and help them develop their teams, their veterinary nursing teams, their assistants, their student programs, their technicians, uh, and I just, I absolutely love it. It's, it's a dream job to me, something that I feel is like right up, you know, all my experience has really just kind of brought me here and I'm happy to share it. And, and moreover, I get to collaborate with all the wealth of talent that we have in the network and then share those resources. It's really like one big family. Um, so, you know, that's where I ended up and I, and I love where I am right now. I feel very fortunate for that. So, so on the theme of collaboration then, um, and kind of teaching and sharing, and Brianne, talk a little bit about what, you know, where you started and how you ended up where you are. <laughs> it's a whirlwind, right? Um, so Janet always wanted to be a veterinarian or in the veterinary community field. I was always torn if I was going to be Mrs. Frizzle when I grew up or a veterinarian. So I was really torn what I was going to do. I wanted to do education, but I had this being on a farm, had a passion for cats, dogs, she, you know, pets in general. And um, So I always went back to that statement of like, be the person who your dog thinks you are. I mean, you guys have all heard that, right? Okay. And so that's where I really, um, I met a great college counselor and they taught me about what a veterinary technician did. And where you can go from there. They weren't just the, oh, you're a veterinary technician, this is what you do. It was like, no, this, you can go this outlet, you can go that outlet, and you can teach. I was like, sign me up. Um, so from being a veterinary technician, I really kept in the spill of nutrition and was able to network with our Royal Canaan representative um, and with Hills and with Purina. And I just sucked up everything that they were putting down and continued my education and was fortunate enough to come over to Royal Canaan. And now I've landed in corporate affairs. Uh, so now I teach everybody nutrition and I do consults globally and um, hopefully spilling the nutrition bucket over uh, into more uh, technicians in our field and inspiring them to, you know, have food be your first medicine. So that's where I'm at. Um, and can't be, you know, I get, you know, my, my two, you know, five-year-old dreams are coming true every day. So I couldn't be more fortunate. <laughs> love, that, love that. All right. So I'm going to move to Ashley now. So uh, I'm just going to grab on that mention of food and we're going to go to um, Ashley and talk a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah. So it's funny. Um, you know, people are like, oh, so you like cows? And I say, yeah, do you? They're like, yeah, I like to eat them. I said, that's, that's a good answer too. <laughs> answer too. Um, so I actually have been working with cattle now for the last uh, 21 years. And believe it or not, um, I actually didn't grow up on a farm. Uh, my family was military and we lived overseas. And so when we moved back, I'm Canadian. So when we moved back to Canada, um, we moved to rural Prince Edward Island. Uh, it's a province on the east coast, just kind of north of, of Maine, uh, northeast of Maine. Um, and so where my family lived uh, was surrounded by beef cows. And uh, we just developed a really great relationship with our neighbor uh, who owned the cows. And they actually showed cattle competitively. 
Um, so I was really fortunate. I owe where I am today and, and being a veterinary technician to the experiences that I gained through coming through the, the 4-H program. Uh, one of the, the mottos of the program is to, to learn to do by doing. And for me, that really resonated with me. Um, I, I enjoyed all of the experiences that I gained from uh, showing my own cattle and just being a good stockman. Um, you know, <laughs> like Bree said, learning about the nutrition and, and, and herd health and individual animal medicine. And I kind of just knew um, right away that, that veterinary medicine was what I wanted to do. Uh, there was a point when I guess I probably thought that I, I wanted to be a veterinarian, um, but honestly, I got to do a bunch of ride-alongs with our local veterinarian, and I enjoyed that technician role. I loved helping. I loved getting my hands dirty. I loved being the the assistant, the OR nurse, the, you know, the surgery nurse, the 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 you know, the every opportunity that you could be, or just to be a shoulder to cry on for the client as well. So, uh, 4-H is really who I or what I owe all of my um, my passion. Uh, That's a really, really good, interesting angle and a good plug for 4-H there too. Yeah. So DJ, you serve the kinds of animals we don't eat. So talk a little bit now about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, I actually started out uh, wanting to go to vet school. And so I went to tech school so that way I could gain some experience and then hopefully increase my chances of getting into vet school. And I went from Blue Ridge where I went to tech school. And then after Blue Ridge, I went on to a zoo for an internship and then came back and started working at Virginia Tech at ICU. Um, so in like a teaching environment for vet students and I love the environment, but I just wasn't quite sold on wanting to be a veterinarian. Um, so I decided to branch out and then I moved on and went into infectious disease research. And then I started to really discover the avenues that technicians have. Um, and in research, like I, I, I remember telling myself in school, I would never, ever go into research. You know, the things they do, there's just a lot that goes on there that I don't want to be a part of, but it's actually the opposite. Um, veterinary technicians have a, like a very, very prime role in research and that's really protecting the animals making sure we're doing legitimate research and stuff but um so i went on from there into emergency practice um where i was working overnight while i was finishing my bachelor's and then eventually i landed in banfield about three and a half years ago which is where i really kind of found my passion with people and helping to develop people and help them find their common you know dreams and everything they want to be um so that goes from teaching to developing to really just finding the best opportunities that help them be themselves and who they want to be and who they want to grow into um, and I've really been giving a lot of good resources to do that. So I found my passion with people after the long road with animals and different avenues, and that's where I am today. Really good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take back what I said earlier, and I'm gonna combine questions two and three, and we're gonna let the panel answer though answer those, and then we'll open it up to questions among people because I I want to be able to get a little bit more of the feel for what these these folks have have done and accomplished, and then we can start the conversation. So if everybody's okay with that, um, so. We really, with, none of you have an average day, right? None of us have an average day. So if I could ask you each just to talk a little bit about your average day and combine that with a tidbit or a takeaway that you think is critical to what you've chosen to do, how you've chosen to use your technician skills um, and share that you know, with the group, that kind of look, that little tidbit of advice that you would offer up. And go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we all talk at once. <laughs> I'll start, I guess. Uh, so uh, an average day for me is um, talking with the different veterinary technician managers and leaders at a lot of the different hospitals that may be reaching out for development programs or maybe collaborating on something that they've discovered is really good. Uh, we have all kinds of growth, um, like I said, uh, in-house training programs. We also have um, partnerships with formal education programs. So sometimes they may have students in progress that you know, may be struggling with a task and they're looking for a way for us to help them accomplish that skill or task, uh, whether it be in-house or with a formal program. Um, it may be something that they're celebrating, a success of a VTS that just um, you know, was able to accomplish, you know, pass her exam. Uh, so a lot of collaboration there. Um, sometimes they do site visits to these hospitals, which is a really awesome opportunity to see them in their home environment and really establish those relationships and cement them in and, and see where we can help them as shared services grow their, their people. Um, and I really, really enjoy just really working with this whole ginormous team that we've put together and, uh, and develop these different tools along the way using everybody's talents across the country. And you know, one of the biggest things is that in specialty practice is that 
you know, we're counting on 24 seven and, you know, for a really high level of care at these hospitals are doing amazing, amazing procedures and techniques that, you know, really do require that higher level training. So we all have a common goal of, of trying to get the best patient care possible and, and really elevate those skills and, and feel very, very strongly that we're all in it together. So typical day is, is pretty much all of that on the computer or on site at one of the hospitals, you know, working with the different people in the network. That's good. So DJ or Ashley, one of the two of you who are actually working a little bit in practice, compare and contrast then what your day would be like, you know, talk, talk a little bit about yours. Uh, so I can go first, DJ, if you like. Um, it's funny that DJ brought up research because that's how my morning started this morning. <laughs> um, so my average day, it's uh, in a large animal practice, it's wholly dependent on the, the season. Uh, right now, cows are coming off of grass. So the calves are being weaned and they're going into the feedlots. So for us right now, um, we have an extensive pharmacy and inventory that we have to keep because we sell millions of dollars worth of drugs to, to these very large scale feedlots. Um, so I might be doing drug deliveries, uh, post-mortem exams. I'll do digital post-mortem exams at the feedlots. Um, but then at the same time, some of the vets might be on the road, uh, doing preg checking, right? So those calves either go to the feedlot or, and the cows come home and they get preg checked. So there's easily a day that I could be on, uh, on the road with, with our veterinarians all day, just either preg checking. Come into the spring, it's calving season. Um, so it could be like I said, doing that surgical nurse or OR nurse, um, prep nurse stuff, uh, doing C-sections, um, casting legs, um, a lot of nutrition-based stuff for down cows, uh, you know, transition into looking after the bulls. So uh, semen testing, um, do look at a lot of sperm in, in May, June. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then all combined, it's, it's kind of just every day. So that's kind of my field work stuff. But I also do have a lot of um, office tasks. And so one of those, uh, DJ said he hated research, but <laughs> that's actually one of the things that that um, our practice, it, it's one of the, the big things that we do. Uh, we work with a lot of pharmaceutical companies and we'll do field trials, um, applicable field trials. So right now we're working with uh, Merck Animal Health. And so this morning I was building ram randomizations and, and um, just kind of getting ready for a trial that will be starting here in, in a couple of weeks. Um, we also ship probably 75% of Canadian beef to America. So uh, I actually handle all of the exports um, for feeder and fat cattle. Uh, to the U.S. So those are kind of two of my major office uh, office tasks combined with all of the field stuff that I kind of described. Um, so that would be my average my average day. Um, and, and Catherine, you'd asked us, I think it was Catherine, asked us to combine question number two and number three. Is that right? You still want us to do that? Brenda, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, Brenda. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. So, so you still want us to do that? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so kind of my my takeaway or my points or tips or tricks that I would tell you um, would be from my standpoint, when we had the, the little um, briefing here the other day, I said, you know, don't stop looking for your next opportunity. For me, I kind of got bored at one point during my career. And, and instead of getting out of being a technician altogether, I just looked for a challenge. You know, Bree mentioned that she was getting to her five-year goal and, and that was one of the things that I actually did. Um, I sat down and I made a personal and a professional list of goals for the next year, five years, 10 years. And obviously I want those to align as much as possible, but, um, but there were some things that I said, you know, I really wanted to accomplish and I went out and I, and I did those. So keep looking for your next opportunity would be one of the biggest things, uh, develop goals. And I think, moreover when you get into a practice whether that's a large animal, animal practice or small animal is to find a mentor and that could be another technician or a veterinarian for me I don't think that I could have gotten my VTS in clinical practice without the support from the the staff that I got to work with uh, especially the veterinarians that allowed me to prove my skills and my competency in order to gain that that VTS so that I could prove that I was an asset and and that was at the practice I used to be at. And then I ended up getting headhunted by this practice that I'm at right now because of those, those skills and the VTS and, and how I was able to add value to their practice. 
Good comment on adding value, I think, you know, for everybody, no matter what we do. So, you know, DJ working, you know, working for Banfield and companion animal practice, there are probably perceptions people have of what that's like. And I bet you're going to tell us something totally different than what people might might expect. So tell a little bit uh, about how you spend your time and what you've learned along the way. Yeah, so um, every day is different. I really don't, I don't know that I have an average day. I'm sure we can all agree. Um, I think, you know, I try to spend my day at least 50% in the medicine, you know, really on the quality of medicine that we deliver from my hospital. Um, and also things that help us advance the medicine, um, whether it's new tools or, you know, new opportunities that are coming down. Um, that's where I really try to spend a lot of my time is the vision of where we're going. Um, and then the other time is really with my people, um, where I want to sit down and talk with them and understand where they are, how they're feeling about what they do every day, and where it is they want to go. Um, because there's opportunities and that's, you know, within Banfield, outside of Banfield, there's opportunities for everybody um, somewhere in our field. And that's really where kind of my, my lesson comes in. At the end of the day, what I try to do is connect with anyone and everyone I can. Um, and I actually challenged myself that I went to a recent meeting in the summer, um, a large vet meeting. And I usually go to the meetings all day. You learn all day. You're tired. You just want to go back to the hotel. And I made it a point to do something different. You know, I said, I'm going to do that. But then every day that somebody that I meet with, I'm going to have dinner with them and just meet them and understand more about them. Um, and it was exhausting. However, I met so many people. I challenge myself to do things that I, you know, an introvert doesn't normally do. Sometimes you just want to rest, but that's okay. I rested later. Um, and I really, really got involved in some really cool projects, but I made it to that point to really connect with everybody, to take somebody brand new and just completely be vulnerable and go out and have dinner. You know, it takes a lot to ask somebody to, hey, I just met you five minutes ago. Can we go to dinner tonight? You know, what do you have going on? You know, and Abby was with me on some of that. And, I, you know, I said, hey, come on, let's go on here and let's talk about, you know, the nurse initiative and different things going on in the practice because there's really a lot happening in our profession um, that we all have a part of and um, connect with everybody and try to make, try to learn what they do and learn about people. And that's really what our profession is made of as people. And that's what the Bridge Club's all about, right, too. So I know, I know, Bree, in your job, too, you're connecting with people every day. So you've actually taken what DJ said to heart in what you do. Yeah, yeah. So my day either ranges from facilitating uh, people from all areas. They could have no sales experience, no animal experience. They could be IT. And when they walk out the door, they're pretty much getting, you know, as much nutrition training veterinarians and technicians are leaving after they graduate. So uh, we're making them passion ambassadors for nutrition, uh, no matter what their role is here with Royal Keenan. And then I actually do consults for, um, I back up our technical services or just reps that are in the field. Of course, you know, everybody's friends ask questions, right? <laughs> I think that's a lot of my inbox. Um, but I think like the biggest takeaway uh, for me is that I wish I found my voice and trusted myself, trusted my gut, my training, my skills, and my knowledge a lot sooner into my career, advocating not only for myself, but for my patients and my owners, um, where I, I look back and I could have made such a bigger impact earlier on if I just was brave enough to make that leap, brave enough to ask for that mentorship, brave enough to ask for that dinner, um, you know, that phone call, um, you know, I don't mean to throw Kara into the fire, but I was brave enough, you know, two years ago, hey, tell me about this VTS and nutrition. And, um, you know, we never was just like, all right, let's do this. Um, so, you know, just be brave and, and trust your gut. Really great insight. And I have to say, oh my gosh, you guys, we got through those and we still have two minutes left before we're at the end of our. <laughs> Well, yes, there comes the two minutes. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> two minutes before we end our 25 minutes. Um, now, that said, as Catherine said, I hope you guys will hang on for the after party because truly that's where the most fun stuff usually comes up. If you have to leave, we certainly understand that. But would love now to, to um, open it up for a few minutes to you guys' questions about what our panelists have to say or, you know, or to ask each other specific questions as well. So does anybody want to, uh, to kick it off with a question or a comment about what they've heard? <laughs> I <I'm laughs> <just laughing. laughs> hey, hey, you, you there in the back, the quiet one. You go ahead. <laughs> question. Well, I actually, so I know we're coming on the 25 minute mark, but I, I honestly am really, if someone were to come to you and I do want every panelist to answer this question, if someone were to come to you, how do they get your job? What do they have to do? So I would be curious. So if I could have every panelist that recognize we're one minute away. If someone has to leave, all I want to do is my last plug is we have an amazing session tomorrow. 
with <laughs> Rebecca. And so I just want to make sure Rebecca's raising your hand really quick. Um, oh. Oh no, Dennis, Denise. So that's so, but we have an amazing session tomorrow. Sorry, Rebecca, you're just in my mind all the time. Um, <laughs> but it's a great one tomorrow. But I would love everyone to answer that question because if if someone said, "How can I get your job?" I want to know how you'd respond. Good one. Okay. And no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone asked me that question, and I would tell them to show a lot of passion for your profession. Be open to everything. Take every opportunity that you can to grow. Um, never stop learning, and uh, and really, you know, connect with people. It, it's really important to be able to form those relationships, to be able to listen to people what they want, and be able to uh, really match that with what you can have to offer them. Um, and keep that passion for your pets at, at front of heart for sure, because everything you do comes back to them. So I would say though, Janet, how did you get your, like if I if I wanted your job. <laughs> you have it. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny because it, it just kind of came to me i mean <laughs> but uh you know most of my positions um as we grew the hospital i just kind of, you know i developed them and then uh, when compassion first came in the picture uh they said we want to start this education department and that was my formal title is education and professional development and then we narrowed it down to veterinary nursing and so um, in my job now, yeah, I mean, experience um, in the profession definitely helps. A passion to to learn and grow, develop, create, and collaborate. If you're a quarterback, you're in, because that's pretty much what I do. It's mean, interesting, too, Janet, because what you say, I mean, what DJ mentioned about getting out of your comfort zone and meeting people, going to dinner. You know, what Bree said about being, being brave, it really is about putting yourself out there and networking and getting to know people, right? That, and then opportunities come your way, I think, when you present yourself openly to to them so Absolutely. anyway i'm sorry i'm not a panelist i shouldn't jump in sorry so like dj i'd love to hear like how you like what would for someone to have your job what what do they have to like what would you recommend they do so dj i want your job not that you're gonna lose your job but well i mean it's, it's really about taking whatever they're looking for and just taking your skills and making it that way um you know my job is all operational metrics really but i spend 90 percent of my time with people and that's, you know, the metrics is, is comes after the people, but I had to learn that once I'm in the job. And so I think, you know, don't be afraid to take those risks. Um, it can be a little calculated, you know, you have to look at the pros and the cons of everything, but we all have skills that we forget sometimes. And those are really with people, um, you know, yeah, we're in the profession for animals and for helping animals feel better and be better. But at the same time, you're dealing with people that do that. And so, you know, like in the managerial world, like I am now, um, I enjoy being able to help somebody have a great day and to help somebody see they actually have the skills to do that they didn't feel like they had before. Um, and that just takes, it takes a risk. You know, I came here from private practice for so many years and I said, you know, I want to see what's going on over there. There's a lot changing in our industry. And so I said, let me go on over there and see. But it took that just kind of wanting that curiosity to learn something different and something completely, you know, different from what I was used to, to do that. So I think take risk and just take the complete oddball idea take the one that nobody else wants to go to and do it try it see how it goes um you know even in research myself i had to i read an entire book before i went into this interview because they were asking about you know mouse gestation and things and i was like i don't remember that stuff i never memorized it except for a test but i read the book for that interview and i think that helped me actually get the job because i actually knew those things right away even though i've been taught before i took that risk and i just applied and went with it and i met some awesome people Rebecca, it looked like you had something you wanted to comment on, so pop on in. Okay, thank you. These are all wonderful, wonderful ways to stretch yourself. And I think one of the safest places to grow a career, whether you're staying within practice or beyond practice, is participating and stepping into organized medicine, whether that be at a local level with your technician or organization or even within the Veterinary Medi Medical Association, depending on who has opportunities for you, that's most importantly a safe place to grow. They want to see you succeed. They want to see you step out of your comfort zone. They, they encourage you to have a voice, which is what Brienne, Brienne was saying about having a voice. And I would, if you're not currently in that realm, probably the people who are currently on this panel and, and in this field of, of vision here probably are doing that. But for other people that are on that fringe where DJ said, 
ask people out to dinner, step outside your comfort zone, be engaged, feel the fear, as I mentioned yesterday, and do it anyway. The, the opportunities are just boundless as to where you can go with that. I see a lot of heads shaking. So yes, go with that. Yeah. All right, Bree and Ashley, Catherine wants to hear what you have to say too. <laughs> we, all, we all do, we all do. <laughs> bribe, bribe your reps. No. Um, <laughs> 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 Just get down. That's actually a very actionable one. That's good. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so I, uh, I was the liaison in, in our practice and just networked with everybody. And one day um, we were getting ready for our AHA inspection and I was writing out all the protocols and our veterinarian wasn't doing anything. And I, you know, I, I wrote out everything, laid out everything. And our rep came in. She goes, what are you doing here? Where do you want to be? You should work for us. And I was like, ha good joke. You know? <laughs> and she's like, no, literally, would you give me your resume? And within eight hours, I had a phone call. Um, I started off as a district manager and um, moved, you know, from there, I was flagged um, by one of our uh, head veterinarians in corporate affairs as, you know, something, someone to watch. And uh, throughout my whole career as a sales rep, which was brief, uh, three years, um, my development was, I just wanted, the job didn't exist. Just because it doesn't exist doesn't mean it that won't happen. And I just kept, I wanted a role where, A, I didn't have to move. I have sheep. They can't transfer to Missouri. Um, <laughs> upstate New York, they will not be happy. Um, my family will not be happy. So I wanted a job where I could be remote, still teach, still inspire, embolden that passion around nutrition and how to make pets' lives better. And... I just kept working towards it. So learning just different skill sets, communication, teaching styles, measuring return on investment, because sometimes we do have to do that too. Like when I teach this, where is that gonna get me? And also just being a really good teacher. You know, if you can oversimplify, then you know it. And, um, you know, stay tuned for Thursday and communicating, but, <laughs> um, well, <laughs> But from there, I was called and I was like, do you want this job? I'm like, ha another one. Good job. And you're like, no, really? Like, this is where we want you. And, um, you know, so communication. And if you want to specialize, specialize. Like, it's out there. Grab it. Um, you know, get the support. Reach out. Uh, because we, you can take it to the next level wherever you and see that going. And a good segue, I think, to Ashley too, right? Because talk about specializing. I mean, you've you've really made your own path in a way. Yeah, I sure have. Um, so I'd say <clears throat> I was scribbling down a bunch of notes as everyone was talking. All had amazing points. Um, a quote that I had I had heard once was, "You are the sum of the five people that you spend the most amount of time with." And mm -hmm. I really do believe that, and it kind of goes with what I had said earlier about, you know, getting a, a mentor and somebody that you can, um, that has buy-in and will let you do things. Because I think if you are passionate, um, as Janet had said, um, and, and you've got that drive and determination. I mean, I've been accused of of being able to sell ice to an Eskimo and, and totally buy into what DJ had said is that like, I can talk to anybody. I can easily say, excuse me, sir, is this seat taken? Or excuse me, ma'am, do you know what time it is? And start a conversation from there. And, and, you know, I, I definitely appreciate that there are people that can't do that. They don't possess those skills. So, I mean, I think that that is one thing um, that's really important. And actually I, I guest lecture at a local tech college um, and I had a, a student that she missed the, the talk and she contacted me. She was really interested in large animal medicine. Um, she asked if I was free for coffee. I said, absolutely. And I actually brought my resume with her uh, or with me to show her because I, it was one of the things that she just based off of the question she asked me in her email, she, she said, what do I have to do to get your job? And, and so I brought my resume with her. I said, these are the things that I volunteer in. Uh, these are the, the continuing education seminars that I've gone to. These are the practices that I've used as stepping stones. Um, or here's the tasks list that, uh, of things that I, that I did. 
Uh, and these are skills, which I told her classmates, these are skills that I believe that you should possess when you graduate so that you are an asset to whatever practice you go into. Because there's certain things that I think people take for granted, but when push comes to shove, especially with farmers, um, you can't, you can't BS, <laughs> you, like, you know, they're going to try to, they're going to try to catch you in things or, you know, it's, it's just as easy to say, I actually don't know that answer, but I'd be happy to go find out for you. And I think you get a lot more integrity or you have a lot more integrity that way and a lot more respect. And, um, and so, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm absolutely DJ, let's go for dinner. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all, I'm all for that. And, uh, and just putting yourself out there uh, amongst the people, you know, that you want the person that you want to be right exposure to those, those people go have that elevator speech at some CE conference to a veterinarian that you're like, Hey, I've heard of your practice. Your practice sounds awesome. That's how actually I moved out to Alberta from PEI. I was going through the, the classifieds for the Alberta Vet Med Association um, website on the website. And I came across all these practices that sounded amazing. And I just sent them emails and I just said, your practice is amazing. I hope that when it's time for me to do my tech externship, that I'm lucky enough to find a practice like yours. And I got so many offers to come and, and do it. I wasn't trying to brown nose. I was being absolutely genuine that like, holy cow, your practice sounds awesome. How do I get there? So I found Ashley, I do have to interrupt. I found Ashley because of Janet. Because Janet read about her in an article and um, Janet gave me the article and I cyber stalked and then called <laughs> and all this stuff. And look at how cool we are now because we have Ashley here. <laughs> so, yeah. so because yeah. that was a great Janet article. I read an article, passed it along and that person was Janet. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> I think, I think it all brings back a really good point though, right? I mean, networking, believing in yourself, putting yourself out there, asking the questions, being available to opportunity, right? And not closing yourself off to it. I mean, there's so many common themes among the four of you that um, I think are, are it's, it's, it's really fascinating, right? You're, you're very diverse paths um, that you've taken and the very diverse places you've ended up, but there are some really common themes there among that. So, um, Questions, people. Anything else you, you want to know? You want to dig into anything more specifically? I want to know why Ashley's living in Prince Edward Island, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> it's really cold. You know? <laughs> oh, the fun. wind hurts my face sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when it hurts to breathe, it's a good day, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So has this been helpful? Have people learned something? Have you you know, have, have you come away with this? I mean, we're coming on 737 right now and we do, you know, do try to keep this at 45 minutes at the most. So I don't want to cut anything short, but I want to be sure that we're getting, you know, to things that you might want to know or hear while we have a few minutes left here. It's hard to get four panelists to really engage themselves in a short period of time, right? So we apologize that this one's going a little bit longer than most bridge clubs in terms of just content, but I hope you guys will agree it's been really well worth your time. It's been a, you know, valuable information and you know again that got to give a shout out to Banfield because without Banfield we might not be sitting here right now so truly appreciate um, that they stepped up to to say yay we want to be a part of it so anything, um, anything else this will be something that a lot of technicians will want to watch because the opportunity of the variety of, of, of career opportunities I don't think it's ever been really laid out it's kind of out there nebulous um, and I'm sure that uh, if you if you know someone like Kara in your life and you and you sit down with Kara, she'll tell you all the opportunities. But to be able to have those things kind of out there in a broader forum, um, hopefully this helps a lot of technicians because I think the advice has been really powerful. I've written down a lot of amazing things. Um, and, you know, Brenda and I have both been around a long time. This is probably one of the coolest things that we've ever done is this session right here because I'm learning a lot. So I have to just say... Thank you to everybody for being a part of this. Uh, Celeste, I think your point that you put in there, if you can't reach the people, the clients themselves, then you really can't reach the pet. And I yeah. think the value of what everyone's bringing here is the idea of you gotta be, you gotta be good. I mean, like uh, motivated and passionate and doing those other things. Very cute uh, there, Janet. Um, and be able to then reach the pet itself. Yeah, everyone, just bring in your people. Bring them in. Dogs, kids, husbands. <laughs> I was expecting Ashley to have a, a cow, but that's yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so 
would have been much harder. Like in, in her <laughs> living room, the cow would have shown up and just been over her shoulder. So Thursday, agree. Bring a sheet. Bring a sheet in. Yeah. Yeah. On the wall, if that helps. <laughs> I have a I have a question that some of the people that might be you know listening later on this, and everybody has mentioned to a level of being brave. And how do you transfer that to a resume or cover letter? How do you express that you're confident that you have good skills that you have all these things? Because I feel people are really Ha, uh, stretch themselves when they have to explain all of that in a resume or cover letter. What advice could you give somebody um, along those lines? Great question, Rebecca. I've um, mentored a few with their resume. I'm a big believer in that first section of your resume to be your your non-resume skills, action-oriented, you know, um, or not driven, but you know, able to take the lead, able to work alone, good team player, communication strengths. Because sometimes when we just bullet point those little things of what we do in our role, it doesn't express that. You can communicate that. You can, um, you know, you're able to work alone or you're able to take the lead. And just that, uh, you know, planner, it, we miss some of those little tidbits. So um, really that's part section of the resumes is a great area of opportunity to really call it out because they will call it out in an interview. I call it out um, when I interview people for other um, offices that I assist in. It's like, okay, tell me, you say you're actually going to give me an example. Um, so if you do put it on there, you've got to make sure you can bring it. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I'm also a fan of not afraid of trying new things or willing. I like those two words. Um, we teach our students at the ABA program and they're just entering into this profession. They're like you have got to be very open and willing and be brave for sure. But I, I look for that, you know, when we, we also have like a, um, at their last class, they receive a resume writing class and we throw in more than the standard in terms of like, what is the veterinary profession looking for? Are you flexible? Are you willing to try new opportunities and, and not just this one job because your job will grow and change? So those are, those are some of the things that we coach them on. And so Catherine actually kind of put me on the spot here yesterday when we were, uh, when I tuned into yesterday's talks and, and that was kind of something that, uh, that I had said as well. Um, I think that, uh, I think that, that the opportunities are, are kind of endless for, for some of these things. And, um, if, if you can put yourself out there and you can, um, surround yourself by these people and, and uh, you know, exposure and everything like that. I think it's so important um, to your ability to, to sell yourself really is what it comes to. Um, you know, when I talk to that student about the, the resumes as well, um, I think that there's, there's a part of it. I think that, you know, your opener, it doesn't have to be like the bullet form. I think that the opener needs to really um, catch somebody's attention too. I talked to one of the other techs in her office and she's like, I don't even read those. I said, for me, I almost wouldn't even read what the rest of the resume say, would say, I would want to look at that, that opening, you know, cover letter, um, and really read what someone, uh, has to say in their experiences and what they're willing to do. And, and, uh, one of our vets, uh, this is what Catherine had asked me yesterday, you know, one of our vets will say, Hey, Ashley, you know, can you do something for me? And I said, yes, absolutely. And, and, and he laughs. He's like, you don't even know what I'm about to ask you. And you're saying, yes. But I think if you're able to just say yes to people, uh, be willing to add to your toolbox. Um, one of the discussions right now in Alberta is whether or not technicians are going to be able to, uh, or should be able to preg check. Uh, whether it's a diagnosis or a detection. Um, and, and I've had discussions, great discussions with veterinarians and they say, well, our techs don't even want to do that. I said, have you asked? I, I can't imagine. You're in your hand and saying, I, I, I would like to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm not saying it's for everybody, but have you genuinely asked? Because I would suspect that if given the opportunity to advance yourself, what technician wouldn't want to, what, what technician wouldn't want to add a skill to their toolbox? I mean, you'll try anything once then, and to say that you did it and maybe you will like it. Maybe you just haven't empowered that technician to, to do it. Good comment. Yeah. I'll just add okay. real quick. I think, um, you know, when you're writing a cover letter, I think it's really important that you do your research and know the core values of the organization you're applying to, because if 
if your personal core values don't match theirs, it may not be the best for you. And I think if you know their core values, you can connect right away in that first paragraph. And how will you match with their values of organization? Because if, if you don't believe in what they do every day, if, you know, personally, you can't do that every day, that's just not part of you, it may not be the best for you. But I think you really need to do your research into figuring out things they're a part of. Um, and that comes from, you know, when you go on Google, just search, you know, acronyms and things that are just specific to that company, because then you're going to find places or articles or things that they're involved in from a community standpoint. You know, if your organization is in the community, you know, it's positive, you know, they're doing things to help other people, help other organizations, help other communities themselves. Um, and if that's something that you love to do, do it. But your first paragraph, I think, is the is the most important. And, you know, kind of going back to what Ashley was saying is that, you know, there are some people that don't even read cover letters. And, you know, I think about that long term. Why is that? And is it because they haven't gotten anything from it? Um, you just have to figure out how you can connect right away with that organization and what that person wants from this position and how you're the right person for it. That's a really good point. Really good point. So to this point, we have a question here that I, I do want to throw out there. Um, so do you guys recommend, do you all, I don't want to say guys because only one of you is a guy, but <laughs> do you all recommend that um, a bachelor's degree in veterinary technology is a good thing to invest time and energy in? Comments, questions? No? Yes, maybe? That's one of my regrets. <laughs> Going back to that question, you know, your tip or regret. Um, I got my associates like years ago and I really wish I would have gone for the bachelor's and uh, it just seems like it opens up so many, so much of a world of opportunity <clears throat> that you might not be, have the ability to, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're just with associates. Uh, so, you know, for a lot of our students that are considering it, I'm like, I, I absolutely would highly recommend it now. I think it's, it's definitely like opens up a lot more doors. Yeah, I, I'd agree and say the same thing. Um, and even if you work for an employer, if you can only afford an associate's degree yourself, maybe they'll sponsor you. You know, if you work yeah. for them for a few years, maybe they'll help you get to your bachelor's if that's what you want. Um, but at least get started. And if that's something you want to do long term, why not? It elevates the profession, it elevates you, and it elevates the quality of medicine you, you do with your pets. So, great comment. Mm. And I, I, I um, was able to get where I am because I had a bachelor's. I do not have a bachelor's in veterinary technology. Mine is in non-human primate enrichment, so go figure. Um, <laughs> but um, where, you know, take, you know, if, if you don't want to do the managerial part of a veterinary technician degree or you want to, you know, or do another aspect, get if you want a bachelor's get it in what you have a passion for um or where you want to grow yourself um you know i have um one of my mentors right now she's getting her bachelor's uh but it's in communications because she isn't comfortable communicating and it's stretching herself so she's specializing in taking higher courses in ven veterinary technology but she's getting that bigger foundation um to obtain her bachelor's and it's going to be a bachelor's in communications um, so where you see yourself going, then get that extra educational experience that way. So you can check all the boxes, um, for your next goal. Well, Ashley, Canada doesn't even have uh, a differentiate between associates and, and bachelor's programs. So I did two years of a bachelor degree in, in sciences, uh, then decided that I wanted to, to do a tech diploma. So it was, um, there were some three-year programs and uh, two-year programs available, and I did a, a two-year program. Um, I haven't really, I, I think in my 10 years as a technician, no one is really discounted me or asked if I had a, a bachelor's or I don't think that that really made a difference. I have considered going back to complete it just because, um, but it would be for me and not, not for an employer. Um, I think that the VTS uh, probably was worth more to me in, in the end or, or, you know, at least to where I am right now. Um, but that's just my personal experience. That's good. So guys, gosh, time flies, right? We are at 7 to 49 Central Standard Time. So we are zipping right along. Um, I think unless anybody has a final question that maybe we'll wrap things up and let people get on with their evening. But before we do, I want and to- uh, And most of us are out of wine. And most of us are out of wine. <laughs> when you drink bourbon, you sip it slowly so it lasts longer. <laughs> That's my tip for the evening. Drink bourbon, it lasts longer, right? Okay, so there you go. Y'all came away with some very valuable from Catherine and me. 
Um, this is Zoom, but um, quick comment before we before we close up. Um, we do have three more days of really good programming left on the schedule. So if you're not signed up and you're interested, go to the website, check it out, um, see what we have coming down the pike. Please stay engaged with us. Let us know how we did. Let us know how we can do better. Um, you know, you can always reach out to Catherine and me. It's really complicated. Brenda at thebridgeclub.com or Catherine at thebridgeclub.com. So we'd love to hear from you and, and have your ideas. And um, just want to give another big thanks to Banfield Pet Hospital for helping us make this evening happen. And I would really like, Abby started this out. I would like to ask Abby if you have a final thought the way you would like to close out our evening. Um, just what I took away from listening to everyone was the passion around continuing to elevate our profession and being brave and standing up for what we believe in. And I just can't think of a better way to wrap this up than for that to be our last thought is to just be brave, be respectfully disruptive is what I always say to keep <laughs> advancing um, our profession. So happy Vet Tech Appreciation Week and I'm so happy to have been a part of this. Cheers everybody. Yes, cheers. cheers.